process. Uh, over 60 minutes have been allocated for this portion of the meeting. And before we begin, I'll give a few guidelines, and I have reviewed a few of these uh, at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, those signed up to speak will be called upon in the order that they signed in. Uh, individuals that have not spoken at the last two meetings will speak first. I'll say that again. Individuals that have not spoken at the last two meetings will speak first. Those individuals that have participated in the previous meetings will speak last. We want to make sure that uh, folks that haven't been heard get their voice heard. That's the whole point of us being here. Um, we ask that everybody is professional and respectful of their allotted time, so we can listen to all of those that are signed up to speak. Time will be allotted to individuals based on the number of speakers wishing to speak. Groups or organizations with three or more representatives may be given up to five minutes to speak. However, this allocation may be decreased based on the number of speakers at the discretion of the committee co-chairs. <coughs> All right. Persons organizations must sign in person by 6.30 p.m. So if you haven't signed up, love you. In order to be recognized to speak. Persons registered to speak must be present in order to give their time to another registered speaker. No time may be given to a person not registered to speak. We call the names of three speakers at a time, allowing speakers to be ready to present. So, after you're done speaking, I'm going to call the next three speakers. So I know everybody's very enthusiastic and wants to applaud for their particular projects that you're here to support, but um, try to be respectful of the folks next up in line. Uh, prior to beginning your comments, we ask that each speaker please state their name, district, and the subject that they will be addressing. This information will also be displayed on the screen for the committee members and the public. We're getting better at this, guys. <laughs> if you brought materials with you, staff will be passing those out to the committee members on your behalf. If you did not submit your materials when you signed up to speak, we ask that you please provide those items to staff at this time. Raise your hand if you had materials and you did not present them to staff. Okay, awesome. Without further ado, we will call the first three speakers. Uh, so we're doing, sorry. So it's one and a half minutes per speaker and five minutes per group. One and a half minutes per speaker and five minutes per group. And can I get a hand raised from whoever's doing the time? Thank you very much. All right, so uh, the first three speakers are actually groups. Uh, Jane DeBell is the first speaker for Jane DeBell Park, which is District 7. And then Steve Hickson for Phil Harper Park, which is District 9. And then Denise Gross for, for uh, the Harbor Park District Number. Hello, I'm Jane Newbell, and I'm here uh, on behalf of Jane Newbell Park, District 7. It's a park that's only a year old, and we have six acres, and the only thing City Park gave us was a walking path and a pavilion with four benches and tables. And I was able to get a federal grant from the Kaboom people in Washington, D.C. to get some playground equipment. It was worth about $150,000. <coughs> And the government had to investigate me, and uh, all I had was one speeding ticket. <laughs> so I passed. So they were able to come out, put in playground equipment, uh, bushes, trees. Beautiful, beautiful. And so all we have from the city is a portable potty. And it's ridiculous because they parked it right close to the pavilion. And when you're sitting at the pavilion eating, the breeze comes from the southeast. And I was there Monday with a picnic, and it was very embarrassing. And it smelled terrible. And they tell me they can't move it because they don't have the money to put it on another path. It's not sanitary. I went there last Sunday a week ago, and I opened the door to it, and i tell you what, I wouldn't have put a bird in there. It was so filthy at 7 o'clock Sunday morning. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you very much. 
and we need more parking. Understood. Thank you very much. Um, so, if you're looking for that park on your list, committee members, it's actually in District 7. It's part of that District 7 park improvement. Next up on the list is Steve Hickson for Hill, Hill, Hill Harbor Park, District 9. Uh, hi, my name is Steve Hickson. I've lived in District 9 for over 20 years. And I'm here to support the city staff's recommendation to fund the land bridge over at Wurzbach Parkway to connect the two parts of Hard River Park. Please put it on the 2017 city bond. Hartberger Park consists of 330 acres divided by the Wurzbach Parkway. It is a jewel on the north side that is teeming with residents from all over San Antonio that flock to this green oasis to enjoy its trails, paths, fields, and playgrounds. However, to cross from one part of the park to the other, you have to drive by car or bike and go down the busy Northwest Military Highway and then on Wurzbach Parkway for over one mile to get to the trails on the west side of the park and reconnect with the Howard P. Greenway Trail Project. If you're a white-tailed deer, roadrunner, raccoon, possum, or wild turkey, you must cross Wurzbach Parkway with a center little wall there where the seldom obeyed speed limit is 60 miles an hour and more than 25,000 cars travel each day. You can imagine the amount of road kill and vehicle damage. The land bridge will be a unique hybrid because its design allows for both wildlife and humans to cross in safety and natural beauty well above Wordsbach Parkway. No other bridge of which we are aware has been designed with this combination of functionalities. The bridge will also allow emergency and park services vehicles to travel quickly from one side to the other. So how can all that happen on one bridge? Well, the bridge itself will add about one acre of land to the park. It will be 150 feet wide, 150 feet long, with upsloping sides that will be landscaped in such a way that users, both human and animal, won't even realize that they're crossing over a busy road below. A gently sloping skywalk will allow bikers and runners, walkers, strollers to travel gently up into the tree canopy to reach the bridge. So of course now, what about the money? The bridge will cost $25 million. Seems like a lot to be compared to the bridge in Los Angeles for cougar migration, no humans. That'll cost more than $56 million or the $250 million project in London to put a bridge over the Thames. We are asking for $15 million from the San Antonio bond funds. The Phil Hardberger Park Conservancy will raise the other $10 million from private funds to build the Tricentennial Land Bridge. The $15 million be allocated by $7.5 million from the Parks, Recreation, Open Space Committee and $7.5 million from the Streets, Bridges, and Sidewalks Committee. Those allocations represent less than 1% of the $850 million bond initiative to each committee. The result will be a world-class bridge for $15 million. The previous owners of the land that is now Hartberger Park are the voters. They set up the voter fund and it has pledged $1 million to help complete the privately raised $10 million funding of the bridge. The Hartberger Park Conservancy has already committed $1 million into world-class design and construction plans. The Phil Hartberger Park Conservancy has raised and spent almost $730,000 for the facilities and amenities of the park, all of which are enjoyed by the people of San Antonio without any cost to them. My wife and I, through our family foundation, have given $15,000 to the Hartberger Park Conservancy. I put my money where my mouth is. <laughs> The Phil Hardberger Park Conservancy will raise the $10 million to build this fantastic, visionary, world-class, unique bridge. If you'll help us with the $15 million bond initiative, please. As Councilman Joe Pryor, District 9, said, 100 years from now, no one is going to ask, what did this bridge cost? Everyone is going to say, what a brilliant move to get this. Thank you for your consideration. It's cheap. Next up, we have Denise Gross and uh, Tom Guido from Hilbert, Phil Harder Park District 9. Brenda Gonzalez and Jeff Jordan from Storm. Uh, 
uh, and then uh, Michelle Stewart from Friends of Blood Creek Park, District 10. Awesome. Thank you. This is Tom Guido, also part of that group. Okay. My name is Tom Guido. I'm, I'm a, uh, I live in District 9. Uh, I've been a resident of San Antonio since 1951 when I was born at the Knicks Hospital. I want to speak to what makes San Antonio unique. And the answer, who we are, the people that live here, all of us, and where we are, the place that we live in. The place is made up of many wonderful environments, downtown, neighborhoods, streets, roads, buildings, and parks. So I'm, I'm here to speak in favor of the land bridge at Harbor River Park. As a member of the Harbor River Park Conservancy, I want to point out three specific items. One, the park is open to the public and is free at all times. Two, the conservation and habitat restoration is continuous and ongoing. I don't know if y'all have visited the park, but it's a fantastic place. And it's a tribute to uh, a successful mayor, uh, Phil Harbert. The land bridge is a dynamic way we'll join two parks to the total of 330 acres, separated by the Worst Block Parkway. This structure will soon be recognized worldwide. It will enhance and support the tourism of a great world city, San Antonio and will allow each and every citizen to commune with nature in an accessible and convenient way. We are getting much more than we are paying uh, for, uh, for, and the benefits to San Antonio this investment will last long into the future. Thank you. Next up is uh, Brenda Gonzalez, Rob Lane, and Jeff Jordan from Storm, and uh, I'll be speaking on McAllister Park, no leash name. Hi, I'm uh, representing um, Storm, the South Texas Off Road Mount Bikers organization. Um, our interests are uh, 4, 7, 9, 10, and 15. Um, we represent the union. Can you lean into the mic a little bit more? So, <coughs> so as an umbrella contributing club, Storm advocates responsible mountain biking um, by adopting sustainable trail building, trail etiquette, <coughs> bike safety, and practices that ensure the successful future of our school. Through proven history of collaboration between land managers, volunteer groups, and other local stakeholders, such as local businesses, private landowners, um, environmental organizations and community leaders, Storm approaches the advocacy and organizing its based on coalition building amongst these various trail and park amenities. So Storm has been the local mountain bike advocacy group since 1997, um, except for last year where we were working with the San Antonio Parks and Recs to um, work out a memorandum of understanding with the city. Um, we have performed trail maintenance at the Oakley Chamber Park, McAllister Park, um, Leon Creek Greenway, and the Salado Greenway. There's also a time when the Texas Cross Country State Championship race was held um, at McAllister Park um, by school. Mm -hmm. Um, that because of the popularity of sport and the size of the participants, this was moved to um, the Hill Country Flat Rock Bench. This year also, Brighton's Bicycle Shop will be putting on a four part country at the house to park. So, in addition to our advocacy and trail building, we're storming several programs aimed to increase the safety and enjoyment of our sport. Storm Kids is held the uh, first Saturday of every month at McAllister Park. Um, this promotes physical fitness, trail etiquette, and bike safety. We also have our children and drilling events. Um, these are held at different uh, locations throughout the city, McAllister Park, OP, um, and other parks and greenway areas. Um, this promotes physical fitness, um, trail etiquette, bike safety, and a strong sense of community. 
Um, we have a st trail stewards program, which is not the city program. This is within Storm. Um, these people uh, usually uh, monitor the trails where they live and the parks and the ways where they live. And they let us know about any trail maintenance that needs to be done. If there's down trees, then we communicate with the city. We get the city out there to help us if you uh, do down trees if uh, trails are eroded or blocks and how then we get out there and do that. We also have uh, weekly storm rides that are held at different locations, but mostly Oak East Naval and Calcer Park. This summer in July, um, we had a huge COVID event for the month of July. Um, we hit three parks, the Calcer Park, Oak East Naval Park, and Olmos Basin. We had 41 volunteers at four plus hours of keys. That was about 185 hours of trail maintenance. And this is just the natural surface trail. Um, that also included the young people removed trails. And so we're, we're excited to have finalized our um, memorandum of understanding for San Antonio Parks and Recreation um, Department, and we are ready to embark on a goal um, of providing ethical and sustainable trail access. Um, we are also currently planning a fall maintenance project with REI and the San Antonio Parks and Recreation. Um, this project will address the extremely eroded trails um, in the Kelster Park. And we would also like to extend our services um, to those districts here. We have experienced trail designers, builders, um, and <coughs> they can really get back to the community. We'd like to be involved with Pierce Hall Park, Classic Student Ranch. Um, we'll be involved with Friends of McAllister Park and the updates that they'll be, they'll be doing to McAllister Park. Um, and we'd also like to be involved with the updates at Oak East Naval Park, um, the dog park, and if it's going to be encroaching on any of the trees. We'd like to address that before they move. Um, and I thank you for your time. Currently, there's none anywhere in the entire park. We have continuing instances of poaching with bow hunters and they're beheading the deer and leaving the bodies behind. We also have wild game trapping and we found a lot of traps in the in different areas of the park we can dismantle them and remove them. Um, there's also ATV, thank you, a dirt bike, four by four traps at all hours in the park. We think that some surveillance might help deter that. We at least hope. Um, we'd like to build a small dog park in the park. As of now, of course, it'd have to be up at the top out of the flood area. We have a lot of dogs that are running off leash. Um, I also have this yeah. one. Steve, I uh -huh. Wait, so who was this again? Sorry. Steve Alexander. Okay, okay. So you're going to allow her your time? Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a lot of dogs that are allowed off leash and, and run the entire park. Some of these loose running dogs are chasing the wildlife, some causing injury to the wildlife, and there's been at least one off leash dog that's died from snap, uh, rattlesnake bites. These loose dogs also scare people and intimidate the leash dogs. So we want all the dogs and all the people to be able to come out and enjoy the park. Building an enclosure would benefit all. This enclosure would be for the welfare of the off leash dogs, the wildlife, and the park goers. It would be safer for all of all. <coughs> We'd also like water fountains at the two entrances because we have none. So there's no water on the property at all for anybody to get water. Um, and we'd also like to assess and repair the rutted and rough uh, natural surface trails. There's some really steep, kind of dangerous trails that are out there, and a lot of people have actually stopped going because it's too hard to navigate right now. Um, so we would want that fixed. We'd also like to install nature-friendly trailheads and markers along the trails so people can figure out where they're going because right now there's nothing. Uh, we'd like an, a pedestrian entrance as a second entrance. So currently, it only has a vehicle gate and there's a broken lock, and that's where the trucks are getting in. So it would be nice if we had a little, a little entrance there where people can get in and we can get another lock for that gate. We'd like to install a small informational kiosk at the main entrance of the park where we can do updates, information, a community board, and a detailed map for park goers. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, next up, we have uh, Phil Hardriver, Betty Sutherland, and Brad Marley. Uh, 
Um, I was speaking as a group for Go Harder and Mark, obviously, in the district nine. Uh, and then we'll have um, Barbara Hall and then Michael Bray. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about the part that bears my name. Uh, I rise uh, today to ask you to let us complete the part. We are three quarters complete in this part, and I'd like to finish it. Uh, as part of the master plan has been since 2008, it's been eight years now, uh, and the current staff recommendation is also to let us complete the part. There is, as you know if you come down there, there is the park is in two parts. And they're separated by about 25,000 cars a day. Um, and it's it's not a good situation at all. We're, uh, by the way, a thousand people a day come into the park. And while it is physically located in districts eight and nine, it serves all of the people of San Antonio at the rate, as I said, of around a thousand a day to come there. Let me go over the math of this very quickly with you. This was a dairy farm that we bought in 2008 for $50 million. That's what the land costs. We also estimated it would cost $50 million to do all of the improvements to make a world class park. We have spent and we have built $25 million of those improvements right now. Uh, those would include the miles of the hiking trails, they would include the urban ecology center, the dog parks, and the savannas that we have built to show South Texans what this landscape looked like at the time of the Alamo. We also have, I believe, the oldest and largest tree in San Antonio. It's about 400 years old. And I'm happy to say, I think it will probably outlast me. Uh, and maybe some of us in this room. Um, but you know, we're like a, we're like a uh, beautiful house that doesn't have a roof. We're asking you to help us. Let us put the roof on that was originally planned. Let us finish this. And I want to emphasize, it is a finish. This is not something that we have to come back again and say, we look like this, or we look like that. At some subsequent bond. This finishes it. And it finishes it within budget. In fact, if we raise from private sources, which I believe we will, $10 million, we will finish $10 million under budget. So I ask you to let us do that. You know, in San Antonio, we like to say that we are world class. That, strictly speaking, is incorrect. We are not world class. But we have done some world class things. When the refugees came here from the two hurricanes, 35,000 of them, we took care of them than anybody in the nation. That's world class. So we can do that. I see Cheryl Stoney is over there. She has brought our finances of the city up to the three major rating companies to give us AAA. We are the only big city in the United States that has those triple ratings <coughs> from all three agencies. That is world class. When we built the Haven for Hope, where all those poor souls that needed help. And we spent millions of dollars to do it. And by the way, we've had 3,000 graduates now that have transformed their life from being on the street to being taxpayers and having a decent life. That's world class. We know that because people come from all the world see what it is that we did. So we can do world class things. We just opened the Tobin Center for the Performing Arts which is now getting all sorts of prizes worldwide. Well, that is world class. So we can do world class. But you do that by working piece by piece and making world class things. You don't make them by making a part and quitting in your three courses. Three. It makes absolute no sense. You know, I know that, well, I also want to mention one other world class thing, and we did that too. The river, the improvements of the river, 
done in 1940 were two miles long. That's the U of the river. It essentially stayed that way for 60 years, except for the extensions that were made during chemistry. But for essentially the river improvement stayed static 60 years. <coughs> now we have 13 miles, from 2 to 13 miles. And I was in the middle of that, and I heard a lot of people say, we can't afford it. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, to be brave, we have to afford to do some things. And that's if we hold our hands together, we can rise up together, we can rise this city together, and have something that is world class and that we will be considered. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Thank you very much, sir. San Antonio Conservation Society, District 1, she'll be speaking on Bracken Ridge, Hemisphere, Seekio, La Vista, and Ridgewalk. You got a lot to talk about, Barbara. <laughs> uh, after Barbara will be uh, Michael Ray and then uh, Andre Sandoval. The San Antonio Conservation Society was founded in 1924 to preserve not only historic buildings, but also places of natural beauty. Many of our efforts over the last 92 years have focused on our historic parks and open spaces. In light of this mission, we are in support of those bond proposals that will help restore and improve our historic parks. Our dedication to the conservation of San Antonio's parks and open spaces motivated us to form the Bracken Ridge Park Conservancy. We are here today to support the $7.75 million in bond funding for Bracken Ridge Park. These funds will go toward vital restoration projects that will enhance the park and bring back its original beauty and function. These projects Projects likely include the restoration of the 1776 Dam and the Sapia, the restoration of the River Wall, and the work of the foundation of the 1877 Pump House, the oldest industrial building in the city. And thank you, Xavier, for mentioning that in your presentation. These projects and others have developed strong community support and will provide a resource enjoyed by all the citizens of the city. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Uh, next, up is, next up is Michael Ray with Oklahoma Partners uh, from District 1. We'll be speaking on Bracken Ridge Park. Uh, after that will be Andres Anduar uh, and then Michael Zapolka. I'm Michael Ray Partners and I there's a lot of meetings here in the room, and certainly I want to thank everyone for taking the time to do this. I chose to, spoke, to speak here tonight on behalf of Bracken Ridge Park as uh, there's a great need here at the core of our city, and I think we all can sit here and talk and think about all the magical events or ideas or experiences we've had in this park. And I think it's important as, as a city we recognize the sort of visual importance of this place. Uh, when you think of San Antonio, a lot of imagery comes to my mind that represents Bracken Ridge. <laughs> Our historic structures, the cities, beautiful San Antonio River, uh, all the things surrounding this park. If you had to pick three images and ensure that we're casting those images out in the world and sharing who we are as a city, I think San Antonio's beautiful Bracken Ridge Park would be one of those images. I just want to make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing by keeping up with that and pushing it forward as much as possible. So please continue to push forward with all of our parks. Bracken Ridge is definitely on top of that list. Thank you.
thank you very much. Uh, next up is uh, Miguel Sepulveda from Staplewood HOA uh, from District 4. He'll be speaking on Staplewood Mars. Uh, Hello, I'm Miguel Sepulveda. And, and, sorry, just a second. Uh, you can reset his number real quick. Uh, and then we'll have Carol Brown uh, and then uh, Travis Wiltshire. Um, I'm Miguel Spoda, District 4, um, with Stablewood Farms Park. Um, just a, um, a good evening, city, city to the committee and to our co-chairs. And a heartfelt thank you to take your time and volunteer to do this, because it, it takes time to, to make progress in, in your community, so thank you. Um, a little bit about Stablewood Park, we're located on New Fort and Highway 90. Um, we're in the West Corridor, San Antonio, that is an ever-growing area. Um, in our park, we have close to 28,000 homes. And this is statistics from about two years ago that visit within a three mile radius and up to 65,000 in a five mile radius. Um, what I've done is I went through, as a project manager myself, I went through and looked at the actual cost for each of the improvements based on the city's cost for um, an item, and, and I factored in what would be needed based on the highest level amount. So, Currently, our park does not have the basic essentials for daily use, such as restrooms, water fountains. And living in the neighborhood myself, I go out every Monday and I clean up the amount of water bottles out there because there's not a, a water fountain for our youth or anyone to refill them um, there. So there's a lot of wastefulness that can be just done by putting in a water fountain. So this is a recommended bond item by the city staff. Um, our recommendation is to up the amount up to the one million mark. That would include a basketball cover for the existing court, restrooms, and a pavilion. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Miguel. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, I have uh, Carol Brown, uh, who is speaking on behalf of the Alliance for San Antonio Missions. Uh, uh, she's a uh, district three and will be speaking on world heritage and land acquisition. After her, uh, we'll have Travis Wiltshire and then Bill Duvall. Okay, I'm speaking for the Alliance for San Antonio Missions. It's a group of about 300 plus San Antonio residents and business owners, the majority of whom live in the communities immediately surrounding the missions. The Alliance has, has long suggested that the city use 2017 bond money to acquire certain Caitlin's key properties in close proximity to the missions to ensure that these properties are preserved and developed for the common good. We have also suggested the creation of the World Heritage Cultural Center, again, in, hopefully in process. Developing the center on a key property near the missions would be an excellent way of accomplishing two goals that could have a transformative impact on our local communities and the perception of our city. We have a proposal to identify sensitive at-risk sites near the missions and acquire those properties for feasible. One of these properties would be the site of the World Heritage Cultural Center that would provide dedicated exhibition space for a comprehensive look at the history and the heritage of the missions and a flexible venue space for educational programming, cultural events, and community engagement. Additionally, this site would be the initial host space for a local business incubator <coughs> that would serve both San Antonio residents and our tourist guests by modeling sustainable cultural heritage tourism. We think there is no better way to show the world the authenticity of our civic values and our commitment to the innovative stewardship of our cultural heritage, which has brought about, of course, the designation. And we would like to work with the city or all to make that happen. The most important take home message here is these properties need to be acquired now, not later. Think of the gridlock, the landlock of the Alamo. That's going to happen to the rest of the missions if we don't take steps to preserve it. There is still a good opportunity to acquire a number of spaces, and we need to do it. There's not many projects that are going to have such an impact for 500 years from now, but it will be bad 
in these areas turn out like a landlocked talent. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike said they are part of the staff recommendations. Uh, next up, we have uh, Travis Wilshire, uh, who will be uh, who is a part of the Phil Harbor Park Conservancy Organization District uh, of District Eight, and then uh, he'll be speaking on Phil Harbor Park. Uh, after that, we'll have Bill DeBell, and then uh, Nettie Hinton. Travis Wilshire. Um, so, okay, all right, well, then we won't have that one. So, Bill DeBell, uh, Jane DeBell Park, District 7. Uh, Bill, you're up. Thank you. <laughs> District 7, Jane DeBell Park, I'm Bill DeBell. We have a uh, Ten marked parking spaces, and at times we have seen from 25 to 43 cars on the double deck parked to visit our park. We need more parking here. We've got a lot of grass there, we can get probably 30 more. Next, we have six acres, and we estimate we're using about 35, maybe 40 percent of the area because of the trees and thick is underbrush. At northern border, we have a big, huge, washed out, eroded area, a breeding spot for what we're afraid of, dangerous species of reptiles. Someday, someone's going to walk out there. It's not about if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. We'd like to see all this underbrush cleaned up. We'd like to see a page second entrance along the south border of this place so we can put more picnic areas in and we did estimate a balance of maybe 350 or 400 square foot square could they investigate and see if a small cell phone diving could go in there. We don't know what this is going to cost. We don't know. So we're experts in estimation. We're not even feel that what we're talking about we put a hell of a dent in a million bucks. Thank you very much. And I want to say thank you to you people who work out here. I'm sure that your job gets ticklish at times. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. If anybody ever wants to compliment the committee, I'll let you speak over time. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> next up, we have Nettie Hinton. Speaking on eight or is part of the A Street Bridge Restoration Organization out of District 2. She'll be speaking on Dawson Park and A Street Bridge. Following then, we'll have Tommy Calder and then Allison Hugh. Good evening. I, I made most of my points at the last meeting, but I wanted to re emphasize a few. The bridge project is not on the list of staff recommended projects but it most certainly should be. And we, the History Bridge Restoration Group, beg you to do the right thing for the right reason and find the money to include the project in the bond, whether it's a citywide aspect or the district two aspect. The restored bridge and the parkland was the project that we lobbied the textile and federal government for, and they agreed to do it. We signed the MOU with the city that said we would provide the 20% match that the federal government required. Part of that match was the in-kind value of the land that the Dawson family agreed to donate. We asked them, don't donate it to us. Donate it to the city of San Antonio because it's going to be the citizens' park. The Dawsons did that. The only thing they said was, name it after us. The current value is about $300,000. The city is reneging, even though we went to trial, we won, and we're in the appeal process now. They're still reneging, and they want to turn that land over to commercial interests. I beg you 
to not let the city do that criminal act. Citizens Mead the Park, which is a part of the hiking bike trail that connects the Museum Reach of the river through Historic Dignity Hill, the cemeteries, and the Slado Creek hiking bike trail. Do the right thing for the right reason. Don't let the city do this criminal act as a citizen's park. Uh, next up, we have Tommy Calvert, Precinct 4. Uh, he'll be speaking on Salado Creek in District 2. Uh, after Tommy Calvert, we'll have Allison Yu and then Catherine Smith. Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, it's good to see everybody. I'm Tommy Calvert. I represent uh, Districts 1, 2, 3, and 10. And the parks I'm speaking on today are in Districts 3 and Districts 2. Uh, I don't have time to go over uh, the master vision of River East, uh, but um, I have this great uh, drone video that gives you a look above uh, from a thousand feet in the air to begin to see some of the things that I do along what can be River East. Uh, but I'm uh, here today because the county has partnered with the city of San Antonio in numerous parks through the venue tax and help create an environment to bring back residents uh, to our historic uh, communities through catalytic projects like the Museum Reach, River North and Pearl, uh, Mission Reach, River South along our missions, uh, San Pedro Creek, uh, which I call River West, connecting downtown and going forward for the next day, decade, I hope, uh, I'll work to create a River East from Salado, uh, on the Salado South Extension from Fort Sam Houston to Southside Lions Park. Uh, I'm here today specifically to ask the committee to support the beautiful jewel that is the Wheatley Heights Sports Complex with additional uh, safety, uh, phones, lighting, cameras, security fencing, landscape architecture, uh, connecting Salado Creek, uh, park benches, historical and ecological markers, signage, access points, wayfinding, mile markers, art, um, adding uh, some sports uh, to a portion of the soccer fields. Uh, I, I respectfully ask for the group time. I'm, I'm just going to finish this last sentence here. Uh, and most importantly, supporting uh, the $14 million the county already invested in the uh, track and, and stadium uh, with proper locker rooms and administration facilities. That would Thank be you, awesome. Commissioner. Thank uh, you, sir. Without objection, could I get it just a few minutes? Uh, I, I have to be fair to everyone here. I, I can't do that. You know, I love you, Tommy, but I can't do that. <laughs> I, I have to move on to the next speaker. In, in, the, uh, in the letter, you will Commissioner, see, I have to move on to the next speaker. I, I am. Uh, in the letter, the committee will see the details of the actual specific monetary request. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, River East is not part of the staff Thank you, Mike. Uh, next. The River East project is not part of the staff Okay. Uh, next up, we have Allison Hugh, who will be speaking on Public Space East. Uh, our, sorry, the organization Public Space East from District 2 will be speaking on Dignity and Lockwood Parks. After Allison, we'll have Catherine Smith and then Elaine Kearney. Again, advocate for all these side parks on the list um, as recommended by staff, including Lockwood and Dignity Parks, uh, Lincoln Park, MLK Park, and also um, I would uh, encourage the community to consider Pittman Sullivan as a living project. Um, we're here to really show that uh, there is collective momentum to inspire a new generation of stewards for our inner city parks. Um, we are um, sort of following the footsteps of great conservancies that have really brought uh, to bear the incredible parks that we know today, Brackenridge Park, um, Yonaguana Park, for example, um, McAllister Park, these are all built on um, a, a kind of combined investment of uh, our public funds and, and private stewards, and we are um, 
hoping to raise that generation on the east side. Uh, we are also leveraging existing funds of um, already 300k in, over the past year in cash and in-kind donations. And uh, this park really represents a place where community services are already um, accessible to people but have the opportunity to access far, far more if we just invest in the basic infrastructure that can bring people to the park on a daily basis and integrate that into their daily routines. Uh, we really think that uh, this is extremely critical on the east side and when money is spread thin, we want to do the best for every single park and this is the beginning of that trend. Um, this is about building a coalition between uh, all the neighborhoods on the east side um, as time passes and success is shown. Um, we've already started to see that by uh, coordinating our efforts with the existing uh, community health service providers, programming goes a long way. Um, we, we hope that this process continues um, past the bond um, as if it is accepted by the committee, this process will continue and um, that coordination and uh, potential will only grow. Hi, Elaine Kearney with TBG Partners. We've been donating pro bono landscape architecture design services. I just want to point out a few of the existing challenges in the Noe Lockwood Park. First, while the park is a beloved icon for the neighborhood, it faces a number of design challenges. First and foremost, Burnett Street bisects the park into two halves, which substantially decreases the usability of either side. And despite the fantastic views of downtown from this park, it's really dramatically underutilized, aside from the basketball courts and the Martina Street Community Center. Perhaps for this reason, personal safety has also been a major concern. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna to, yeah, I'm gonna have to cut you off, Ms. Carrie, that was a timer. Um, you allocated your time to Allison, and that was three minutes. Hey, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Is this considered a group presentation? I, if staff wants to clarify that, because I have it as individuals, which is why Elaine allocated her time over to you. Okay. Uh, so who's the group? Let me let me ask that. Okay. Uh, I. I can, okay. Who is who? I need three people for group. That's what I need. Okay, so who is my third person? I have Elaine, Allison, and then who else? What's your name now? Kathy Estes. Kathy, gotcha. All right. Um, staff, can we give them another two minutes? Can you? Thank you. So this means I'm going to have to take Kathy off the list. Okay, thank you. So um, in order to, the vision that we have for addressing these design challenges is as follows. The major move is to actually close Burnett Street, which is a low traffic street, thus reuniting the two halves of the park. And this would allow new activities which will help to activate it, including new shade structures and expanded and upgraded playscape, dog park, and picnicking areas. A renovation of the existing community center and the addition of an outdoor amphitheater will expand community programming for events. In terms of safety, wider sidewalks with planting buffers along Hackberry, improved sight lighting, and more activity in the park will contribute to a safer experience for all. Can I speak? Yeah. You have that time. <laughs> Uh, my name is Cotton. I work with Lake Plato Architects, and we've also been uh, donating pro bono architectural services for, for this uh, amazing project. Uh, so here I just, just wanted to say that design so far uh, focuses on really building upon the existing programming, stunning views, and successful spaces within the park. Landscaping and minor re renovations to the existing community center on the left here uh, will create more opportunities for community programming, sports, and recreation. Uh, the new, new pavilion design offers a shaded outdoor area uh, with views overlooking the city. 
It includes public restroom facilities, which the park currently lacks. Uh, so this is, this is a place for large community groups to gather for special events or for small groups to picnic in the shade and watch their kids play. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Catherine Smith uh, from District 1. We'll be speaking on Hemisphere Civic and Brackenridge Parks. After Catherine, we'll have Dominic Ortiz and then Ellen Batum. Good evening. My name is Kathy Smith. I'm from District 1, and I thank you all for being on the committee and taking the time to, to look at all the parks. I'm, I am in support of the bond funding for the San Antonio Park, specifically Hemisphere Park and Brackenridge Park. I first came to San Antonio to the World's Fair in 1968, so that was my first uh, site of Hemisphere Park. I've now lived in San Antonio for 33 years, and really over, just in the last three years, have I started using Hemisphere Park with the opening of the one of my gardens. And I'm excited about the future of Hemisphere Park and the opening of the Civic Park. Uh, just, we need the funding to finish Hemisphere Park. Um, I frequent that park with my CASA kids. I'm a CASA advocate. I have a granddaughter. I ride my bike there. When I'm there, I see kids from all over the city, the county, and the state. So this park is uh, serving lots of people from lots of districts. It's already been pointed out. Uh, as far as Brackenridge Park is concerned, that's another park that I've frequented um, in, the, in the past 30 years. I took my children there, been to numerous parties there, taking, taking friends from out of town there. Uh, that's another park that the whole city uses, the county uses, the whole state uses most of these parks. And I would just encourage you to continue funding both of these parks. Thank you. Thank you very much. District 3 will be speaking on Stinton Park, uh, five diamond parking lot leavings. All right. Um, and then after Dominic will be Ellen and then E. Wayne. Um, good evening, um, Parks Park Committee. Um, my name is Dominic Ortiz. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of Five Diamonds and District 3 and their effort to get the park paved you know, for the 2017 park. Um, five Diamonds is a little league located in District 3. Um, Address is 8214 South Florida. Um, I probably played Five Islands from when I was four to 18. Um, and in my humble opinion, my humble opinion, um, it's the best place to play baseball on the South Side. Um, over the course of the last seven years, the park's made um, many improvements and improvements to the surroundings. Um, so it's a, it's a great place to be. and. Parents and kids can obviously see where their inexpensive fees have gone to. Um, parents have appreciated the cleanliness and the safe and healthy environment that's been provided by our board so far. And now that this has come to pass, um, knowing the limits, the board of directors is unable to fund a big ticket item like paid parking. Um, I'm here to ask you if you could pay the parking at Five Islands. Um, please help improve the park for 1,800 kids that play there, exist there, go to visit. Um, thank you for your consideration. Committee well, members, this, this park is not part of the uh, staff recommendations initially, but it is on this new list of unfunded projects. So it's, uh, Thank you very much, Dominic. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Ellen Batuk uh, from District 9. She'll be speaking on Harper Park, Lambridge. Uh, after Ellen will be Deborah Hernandez and then Peggy Grimaldi. Hi, I'm Ellen Pitlett. <laughs> I'm from District 9, and I'm here to support the Tricentennial Land Bridge for Phil Harper Park. I walk over there with my dogs, I go there and meet my friends there, I ride my bike, and it's so amazing to me to see the families and diversity and the use of the park. The terrible thing is, is 
It's two halves, and like the woman said about Digno Dignowitty and Lockwood, you would have to close your road to make it even more functional. Well, you can't very well close Wurzbach Parkway. And I don't really want to ride my bike over to the other half of the park, okay? I, I'm the type of bike rider that's dressed in yellow with Christmas lights on and a helmet, because I don't want to get hit. But the main thing is, what separates this park from all the other parks we've heard about is that it has the opportunity to give national recognition for this land bridge. It's this, you know, it's phenomenal. It'll be animals and people will get to use it. People, it will be in the national press, it'll create tourism, and it'll bring all those young geeky people we keep talking about that love green spaces in San Francisco and New York to come here. And that's what we want. We want to create, we want to keep on the momentum that we've already built with um, San Fernando Cathedral, Mission Reach South. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah uh, Hernandez uh, from District 4. She'll be speaking on uh, Five Diamond. Uh, after Deborah, we'll have Peggy Grimwald and then Melinda Lechuga. Um, hi, I'm Debbie Hernandez, and I just wanted to say a few words. Um, thank you, whoever put our uh, our Five Diamonds on the list and recommended it. Thank you, whoever did that. Um, my son's been going there since he was eight, and um, <coughs> right now the fee is like eighty dollars for kids on the south side. This is so vital to our area. Um, our our little, our little Five Diamonds. I mean, half the stuff there is donated. The Fiesta Commission gave us bleachers. Um, the honors work were given, I think, through city money, possibly. But everything else is picnic tables that we acquire from different places. Every single thing is a hand-me-down for Five Diamonds. And you know what? For the South Side, it's, it really is the nicest park that we have. We don't have anything brand new in that except our concession stand. So this, you, you paving this, the, the grounds for us parents and for the people to go is, is really important. Please don't take this off the list. It's really important for us to have something nice on the south side to offer these kids. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Peggy Grimwald. She'll be speaking uh, on Digging Me a Lot of the Parts. Uh, she's representing District 2. Uh, after Peggy will be Melinda Lechuga. And then we'll have a group represented by Elva Rendon. Hi, good evening tonight. Um, I'm here in support of Dignity and Lockwood Parks. Uh, I want to talk to you from the perspective of a local entrepreneur. I am the co-founder of one of the tech startups here in San Antonio, and uh, I return to San Antonio from visiting all kinds of triple A rated uh, parks around the world. I've been to the Hudson, Park in New York City, Central Park, Boston Parks, Parks in Barcelona, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Mexico City, as well as Toronto and Columbia. And I will say this, parks are maybe number two in terms of where I get my ideas as a tech entrepreneur to my own private shower. And so, just like anybody else, you get your best idea when you're washing your hair, but nothing else beats being able to come up with your better idea when you're riding a bike or running around. And what, the reason why I came back to San Antonio is because while I visited family, I realized that this was the only city that was able to provide me a multi-generational experience. So, in other cities, I only hung out with myself, the, the young geeks who were, who were everywhere studying and being part of the university crowd. But here, when I go to a park, I get to talk with grandparents and I get to hang out with babies. And that's what's very important about doing this, and especially on the east side where you do need that interaction. Thank you very much, Megan. Melinda Lechuga, uh, District 4. She'll be speaking on Blackland Terrace Park. Uh, and then after Melinda, we'll have a group represented by Elva Rendon and then Bradley Alexander. Sorry, uh, after Elva, it'll be Richard Baggins. I apologize. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share my opinions. 
Uh, my name is Melinda Lechuga, and I live in the District 4 area. Can you lean into the mic a little bit? <laughs> yes. Um, my name is Melinda Lechuga, and I'm in District 4. I live in District 4, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Latin Terrorist Park neighborhood. Uh, in the I've lived in this area for 30 years, and I have the distinct honor of listening every morning to Revelry and retreat. That reminds me that I live by one of the top Air Force bases in the United States, where all of our kids go and receive training. That being said, I'm very proud to live in my own terrace neighborhood, and my children have gone to that park. They play T ball. Over the years, we have had numerous um, improvements to the, to the park, but we need more. <laughs> and these are the top priorities. We need addition of covered basketball courts, covered for, for kids in the playground area. We have a summer program that is there every year that would be so wonderful to have. We have need of additional signage for the community center itself. It has been there for many, many years. And also, we need to replace the signs that are outside of the building so we can have the correct telephone number on there. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Melinda. And that's definitely yeah. what happened. Mr. Green, Lack of Terrace Park is part of the initial staff recommendation. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is Elba Rendon, who will be speaking uh, on Benavidez Park, uh, District 5. After Elba, we'll have Richard Backus and then Silva Benavidez. Uh, I don't know if you guys have these flowers that we brought to staff. So, uh, my name is Rodrigo Rendon, I'm from uh, District 5, representing Benavidez, uh, other, uh, Benavidez Park. And uh, it's a master plan that's been approved of the City Council. Uh, we took the page. <coughs> It's right in, right in the middle of the San Antonio, right in the middle of the heart of the west side. Uh, Article 7207 is the west side. And uh, Benavides Park is targeted by 2,500 single family units, over 800 family multi units from Saha, uh, totaling 3,300 people that can utilize that park. Mm. Uh, neighborhoods, existing schools, and senior centers around Benavides Park are Rhodes Middle School, Harbor Hall Elementary, Sarah King Elementary, Brewer Elementary. Uh, we got two senior centers, St. Timothy Senior Center and Good Samaritan Senior Center. All these, all these are right within a half a mile or less from the park. The seniors utilize this park every morning to exercise at that park. <coughs> Multifamily housing around the neighborhood consists of Vira Mendes homes, <coughs> Cassiano homes, Saha, Diaz de uh, Merida and San Juan uh, projects. All these people utilize this park every day that I see. I, I live in the area, so I go to the park myself. Uh, Father Abu Benavides Park is uh, almost 8 acres, 7.96 acres, and it was built back in 1973 and has had no love within the past 45 years. Just three years ago, we started doing some master planning on the park, and uh, we currently have our natural night out, which we have over a thousand people attend that park every year at, uh, in October. And these are the uh, things that we're recommending. My name is Natalia Tovar, District 5, also on Albert Benavides Park. Like I said, it's about four years that so we've been uh, working on this park and it was very, very neglected and our community was even in the news because we were so neglected. And, and the community became very upset because that park was run down by drug dealers and murderers and we had prostitution and everything going on. So in the last four years, we've acquired at least a million dollars in order to make that park look decent. And right now, the children are very happy playing in that park. But we are now working on asking for funding for our second phase to include 1.2 million. And the family thinks they get rid of requirements to improve the park for this second phase. Are there really two new soccer fields with covers for the fans to replace the baseball fields and covers for the fans? Ample parking, picnic areas with shelters, a large pavilion with electricity for our events, water feature playground, ADA type uh, playground, a skate plaza, the recreation facility, a wider jogging or walking path, 
replaced old sidewalks to be ADA compatible, new covered basketball courts, drainage improvements. We have a pond type flooding that happens there. And other things that are on our master plan are covered basketball courts and multi-use pavilion for special events, uh, empowering those um, to include the state uh, plaza. This has been uh, in the works for five years, and we do have that master plan being approved by the city. Um, and for the future, after we acquire this 1.2 million, we're, we're looking for another uh, 1.2 million to have our community center built there. Um, and uh, we have an example like Sunny Millenbridge Community Center and Richard Fair uh, Center. Thank you for your consideration. <laughs>